By 1842, Charles Darwin had developed a viable theory of organic evolution. He wrote it up into an extended essay. But fearful of the reaction his ideas would provoke, he shelved the manuscript where it would remain unread for 20 years. What made the ideas in this essay so important is that at last, Charles Darwin had a mechanism whereby he could explain organic change. This mechanism was what he referred to as natural selection. So how did this work? Darwin had found a lot of evidence to suggest that plants and animals had changed a great deal since the world began, and that present life forms were evolved from other species. He saw that each species produces more offspring than can survive in a given environment due to limits on the amount of food available. Therefore, there is great competition and any advantage that an individual has over another would make it more fit to survive. The more fit an animal is to survive, the more likely it will be to reproduce. And the more likely it is to reproduce, the more likely its special survival characteristics will be passed on. And similarly, the more likely the ones without this special characteristic will be to die out. This, in a nutshell, is the concept of the survival of the fittest. Like all great theories, Darwin's theory of evolution didn't come out of the air. It had predecessors. But the thing that really riveted him most of all was reading Thomas Malthus's work. Because Malthus suggested that human populations were kept in check by famine, disease, and war. Suddenly, Darwin started to look at the researches on the beetle in a different eye. There seemed to be now an appalling wastage in nature. When Darwin first realized this, he said it was like confessing to murder. It was a sudden realization that the world we know today and all the living creatures in it were built on an immense sea of blood. Increasingly reclusive, Darwin spent the next 20 years at Down House refining his ideas. He was getting old and was frequently unwell. He knew full well his ideas were likely to provoke outrage and so had arranged for them to be published after his death. In 1858, however, he received a bolt utterly out of the blue from one Alfred Russell Wallace, who was a professional orchid collector working in Malaya. Wallace proposed a theory of organic evolution which was almost identical to that on which Charles Darwin had been working for 20 years. Wallace's prompt made Darwin start to put his act together and to compile what he saw as a shortened theory of his great work. He was to call it The Origin of Species. It was an instant hit and sold out its entire print run on the very first day. It was a lot easier to read than most scientific books and, as expected, caused a storm of outrage. People were fascinated by this new explanation for life on Earth. And whilst Darwin had been very careful not to state that mankind was descended from apes, it didn't take a genius to see the implication was there. Darwin, of course, had anticipated the reaction. I shall soon be viewed as the most despicable of men, the most arrogant, odious beast that ever lived. Darwin had no love of celebrity, and when his ideas were discussed at a major scientific meeting, he stayed at home. But at this meeting, a young zoologist, Thomas Huxley, was won over to Darwinism, and over the next 40 years was known as Darwin's Bulldog. It was here, in the newly opened museum in Oxford in June 1860, where the British Association for the Advancement of Science discussed evolution. They were addressed by the Bishop of Oxford, a remarkably learned man with a fascination for science. And it was here as well at that meeting that one of the great myths of modern science was born, when allegedly the bishop asked Thomas Henry Huxley whether it was from his grandmother or his grandfather that he claimed a descent from the apes. Darwin shied away from public debate and continued to work until the end of his life. He wrote many later books, but none were as controversial as Origin of Species, not even The Descent of Man, in which he discussed how humans are descended from apes. He contented himself with less controversial topics, and at the age of 72 published his last book, the catchily titled 
worms and vegetable mould. Curiously, it failed to hit the bestsellers list. In it, he describes his experiments on worms, testing their sense of smell with perfume and tobacco smoke, and subjecting them to whistles, shouting, bassoon playing, and even the piano. Sadly, the worms proved to be quite deaf. Charles Darwin died in 1882, aged 73. His ideas have since become the new orthodoxy and provide a mechanism for how species developed on Earth. Even so, they raise as many philosophical questions as they answer. Numerous political thinkers have used Darwin's ideas to support their own ends. At one extreme, Karl Marx wanted to dedicate Das Kapital to Darwin. At the other, the Nazis took the idea of the survival of the fittest to justify their ideology. Even now, Darwinism is sometimes used to promote a kind of evangelical atheism. No doubt, all of this would have appalled Darwin. Charles Darwin transformed forever the way in which we think about life. Even so, in certain quarters today, some people find his ideas controversial. As recently as 1999, the state of Kansas banned the teaching of evolution. Nonetheless, most people today accept evolution, including most deeply religious people, and accept that it forms a good explanation for the physical origins of life. Without it, we wouldn't have genetics, and we wouldn't have modern medicine. Thank you.